This state of play production is made possible by the generous support of Biogen, Biogen, where science meets humanity. As you know, State of Play is engaged in a reflection on the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee known as SNCC. And we have an excellent guest with us now, someone who made a great personal sacrifice to be a part of SNCC, Dr. Frank Smith. He was many things and has been many things. He was for many years a member of the District of Columbia Council. Before that, he was on the Board of Education. And now he is the founding director of the African-American Civil War Museum, a very fine institution. An honor to have you with us, Frank. I'm always happy to be with you, Mayor Pratt. First, I'd like to sort of figure out and share with our audience why it is that you joined. Well, let, let, let me just say that the day I put the key in the door at Morehouse College, I became the most educated person in my family. Nobody in my family had ever gone to college. Very few had finished high school. And so uh, in a way that sort of helped me with my family when they found out I was in Mississippi in the Civil Rights Movement, because they had no idea what college students were supposed to be doing. <laughs> we also, uh, Newland, Georgia is halfway between Montgomery, Alabama and Atlanta. So we were also, you know, in 1955 and 56, uh, when, uh, when the Civil Rights Movement started to boycott there in Montgomery, uh, I was in middle school then and, and high school. And so I heard about this in the papers and stuff. And, uh, then I finished high school in 1959, and like most black kids in Georgia, I took the back of the Greyhound bus from Newton, Georgia to Atlanta. And then I got to Atlanta, I took the back of the Fair Street bus from Atlanta down to Morehouse College. And, and then when I got to college, uh, the Civil Rights Movement started that same year. Uh, by the next spring, I was involved actively in the Civil Rights Movement, arrested a couple of times there in Atlanta. So, and, and then my parents first uh, Knowledge that I was involved in the right movement was when my picture appeared in the paper at Newman, Georgia. They put the, we got the Atlanta newspaper in my hometown. So, 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 so when, when they arrested me the first time in Atlanta, they, all of the students, they said Frank Smith from Newman, Georgia. They put everybody's hometown in there. And my father was living on this plantation. He told me years later that the owner of this plantation called him in and said, What the hell are you doing? Uh, what's your son doing up there? Because my, my name is Junior. My father's name is Frank Smith Sr. So, uh, my father said, I told him that. Uh, that, I, that you, I said, you were grown and gone. You didn't live here anymore. And I said, yeah, yeah, the first chance you got, you just threw me under the bus. He said, well, look, I had six more kids here I had to raise. You were just number one. You were gone then. So I had to, I had to raise the rest of them. So it's sort of a funny way of saying their introduction to me being involved in the movement was when they saw my picture in the paper. And, you know, and I guess from that point on, they just said to me, look, don't get yourself into anything you can't get out of. Because, you know, we don't have any money to get you out of jail. We don't own any property down here of any sort. So, uh, so, so it was. It was. Uh, they, they, were, they never told me not to do it. I have to say, to, to their credit, they never said don't do it. Not one time. And did you ever have second doubts? I mean, there, you know, there was great physical risk. I mean, you know, life and death type of risk. Did you ever think twice about, you know, what you well, were doing? Well, you know, one of the advantages of being in Atlanta was that there were no church bombings there, and there were no. We had a. We had. We think we had the best civil rights movement in the country in Atlanta. Of course, there was Nashville, Tennessee, with Diane Nash and John Lewis over there. Of course, the, the Little Rock uh, uh, people in, uh, in, uh, in North Carolina who actually started the city in doing that. Uh, but we had a very large group there, uh, five or six colleges, Morehouse, Spelman, Morris Brown. So it was a lot of us uh, students there. Uh, and, and we know we went to jail. It was inconvenient. Nobody ever liked being in jail. I certainly never liked being in jail. And I never went except when I <laughs> didn't have any choice. I never, nobody ever liked being in jail. And I, it was not like a walk in the park, but uh, but they that and I do remember one occasion that when I was in Atlanta, they, they put us in a new, a new county jail there, and they just built this dog on thing. We were the first; you could still smell the paint on the walls, and uh, we started singing and carrying on. They put me in solitary confinement in the door jam. They both let me out in two days. The door jam. I ended up staying in there for about five days, and by the third day, they were all apologetic. Well, you know, we didn't mean to do this. We think I got stuck. I said, "Y'all get me out of here." So. Uh, that was my bad experience in, in the Atlanta jail. But, uh, and then in 1962, uh, when SNCC started to, to, to put together a full-time student organization to go out into the Mississippi Delta to organize in Mississippi, I volunteered to go. And let me just say one last thing about that, uh, Sharon. In Atlanta, what we said was, if we could change Rich's department store, change Atlanta, we could change Georgia. That's the dynamic you see at play today in this election that's going on now. 
Atlanta leads Georgia and votes and all that stuff. So, 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 but, but in, what SNCC said was if we can change Mississippi, we can change America. If we change Atlanta, we can change Georgia, we change Mississippi, we can change America. And that's why I volunteered to go to Mississippi. You know, I have so many people were sent to Mississippi, <clears throat> and Mississippi has always been a source of, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, confusion or, or per, I'm per, being perplexed because of the significant African American vote, and we still seemingly have limited impact in the state of Mississippi. Or is that me being too pessimistic? Well, it is true. It's sort of an anomaly that when you get into Georgia, for example, Atlanta is a very liberal city. They've had an African-American mayor there now for the last 20 or 30 years in the city of Atlanta, uh, but, but they can't prevail in state politics. The first time we prevailed in state fight office politics was when, when Warnock was elected down there and last year. And of course, that, that election now was at risk this year. Uh, so, so that's lasted for two years. But in Mississippi, you see something similar. You see the mayor of the Jackson, Mississippi, which is the largest city in the state, the mayor of all, major, every major city in Mississippi is African-American. And yet, we can't prevail in the statewide election. The governor is, uh, is, is a right-winger like the governor of Georgia. The two senators are awful that are in the United States Senate. Uh, we can't seem to defeat these people in statewide office. We're close. We're close. We're getting there. We're itching down the road. We'll get there. So were there other classmates at Morehouse that sort of got you engaged, or did you come to Morehouse? ready sort of to do something about what was going on in America? Well, I think that uh, most of us who were in college in that time in 1959, 60, 61, when the, the, the sit-in movement in, in starts in Montgomery, Alabama, and then the Freedom Ride, I think that was what really woke everybody up. The Freedom Ride started in 1961. So this is my second year at Morehouse now, in 1961. And so everybody was just sort of caught up in this. It was what students were doing. And back to my parents again, I think one of the reasons why they never objected is because they thought all college students were doing this. Uh, and most of us were actually at some point or another involved in marching, demonstrating, boycotting, uh, something uh, related to the civil rights movement. So, so, so it was just a, a matter of time. But let me just say, uh, let me go back for a second. I, and I remember when I was in the eighth grade, I believe it was, a girl named Johnny Smith brought that, uh, uh, that jet magazine to school that had Emmett Till's mutilated body in it. And I, and I was standing around there on the school grounds one day, it was a very pretty day, and, 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 and Jesse Smith was reading the thing, and she's no relation to me, she lived far across town. Uh, and, uh, but she was sitting there crying. And you know, when pretty girls cry, everybody pays attention, even at that age, you know? <laughs> so I go over there to see what's wrong with her. She, she's looking at this thing, and I remember thinking to myself, if I ever get a chance to do something about this, I will. My first opportunity to do that was when I was at Morehouse, and then I volunteered to go to Mississippi because I remember that photograph. And I remember what started that, what was started really the civil rights movement. It was, and I've got that uh, magazine on display here at the African American Civil War Museum in Washington. I've got a tape running all the time of the of a, of a video that was produced by PBS about Emmett Till's murder, which was that motivated the whole generation, the whole generation of civil rights workers. Which, when the SNCC, at, at the end of our SNCC meetings, when we go around asking people what got them, what was their first inspiration to get into the civil rights movement, ninety percent of them talk about the Emmett Till case. No, without a doubt, Emmett Till was, uh, that photo in Jet was a defining moment uh, for, for Black America and obviously for a great many of our youth. Uh, did you, do you think that SNCC represented a greater sense of urgency reflected among young people than evidently was expressed by, let's say, the NAACP or even SCLC? Yeah, you know, uh, you probably know this already, uh, we actually, SNCC was actually formed. We were supposed to be a junior organization for SCLC, the Dr. King organization. Ella Baker, who was the one that brought us together in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in North Carolina at a meeting there at, North Carolina, at Shaw University, to form SNCC. Uh, actually, the meeting was not called to form SNCC. The meeting was called to, to set up some kind of a junior organization with Dr. King. Uh, we spent three or four hours in a meeting with Dr. King, with him and his lieutenants. And they spoke for about three or four hours. They never let us say not nary a word. And about <laughs> 12 o'clock, when somebody raised their hand and said, can we have a few minutes to go outside and talk to ourselves? He said, okay, we went outside and never came back. So we decided we <laughs> wanted to have our own organization. We didn't want to be, and make, now make, now let me just say, at that time, Dr. King was only 10 years older than we were. He was only 10 years old. We thought of him as a bunch of old people. Uh, so I, I joke with my grandchildren now. I'm 79, you know, and they're in there. 
early 20s. And I said, well, you know, it's, it seemed old at the time, but now it doesn't seem old to me. <laughs> but, but, but we were supposed to be a junior organization for SCLC. But we knew that if we were, that our style of demonstrating and our style of boycotting, our style of working, uh, we were not going to be able to do that as, under Dr. King's leadership because he was not that kind of guy. He was a person who was strong and courageous, and, and, and everybody knows that probably the most effective spokesman that the movement could have had at that time. But he didn't, it, it took too long for him to make up his mind to do anything. We, we wanted freedom now, not, 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 not next week. We wanted to be able to vote now. We wanted to be able to vote in the next election. We weren't trying to do something that took 20 years to do. We wanted to do it right away. He just was not, he, he, we made him nervous. I mean, he didn't want to have it. I think he didn't want to have anything to do with us. He wanted to have plausible, plausible deniability for what we were doing. So he was happy to see us go <laughs> out and do our own thing. Uh, he was supportive, but uh, but we wanted to go our own way, and it was it was a good thing that we did. Do you feel that SNCC ultimately had a very consequential role on the entire civil rights movement, particularly the Black Power movement? Absolutely. I you know we we were getting locked up in these little towns in Mississippi, for example. And who did we call to get us out of jail? Some NAACP local NAACP guy who owned property who would come and sign our bond to get us out of jail. Uh, the NAACP lawyers were the ones that got us out of jail. So although the NAACP national office was busy trying to convince us not to do these demonstrations and not to do these marches, uh, the local people were with us on this. They were the ones that were marching alongside of us. So when we were, were put in jail in these old towns, uh, it was the uh, the local people that signed the bonds to get us out. They didn't know us personally, but they knew what we were doing and they knew what we were trying to do, and they would support us. And therefore, uh, I, you know, I remember this little town in Greenville, Mississippi, a man named Carter, who owned a lot of things there in the city. And uh, we were in jail there in Greenville, Bob Moses, myself, and all the SNCC staff. And he came down to sign a $200 bond to get us out of jail. And uh, I didn't say anything to him at the time, but a couple, a couple of years later, I saw him and I asked him, why did he do it? He said, well, you know, my wife, his wife was blind. And he said, you know, my wife told me, I said, you got to go get them kids out of jail. You know, they didn't do anything. You know, they don't have any business down there. So, and he said, he said, look, I had to get y'all out of my wife and cooked no dinner for me. So, so that was <laughs> the whole, everybody was involved in this movement in some way or another. We were the tip of the spear, but make no mistake about it. We, that was the local community was supporting us big time. But, you know, the whole, a lot of the thrust of SNCC was around, you know, say we're going to vote a registration, becoming, a, using our numbers to ha be a force within the political uh, power structure. And you are a reflection of those who did that, as did Julian Bond, as did John Lewis, and as did Marion and Dave Clark and Eleanor and others. Do you think, after all that effort, we are really having an impact on that political structure or, and can we get Black Lives Matter on board with that approach? The SNCC, SNCC Legacy Project has been very closely involved with the Black Lives Matter movement, trying to talk to them about, about the measures and techniques and policies that we use. Uh, and I myself was on a panel when, Dr. when John Lewis was still alive in the Congress. Uh, he had a, a panel uh, during one of the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, Congressional Black Caucus meetings where he brought in several people from Black Lives Matter. I was on the panel and others talking about how we move this thing to the next step. Uh, because in all of these places, like in Ferguson, uh, in Missouri, where, 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 where one of the first most celebrated murders take, took place, uh, the, the, the police department, the mayor, police department, all these people are elected. And, and the police chief was appointed by the mayor. So if you can get some political control over these situations, you can actually temper this Black Lives Matter, I mean, this murder thing too. And uh, let me just add, uh, I like to speak in phrases, part of being in politics makes you do that. But uh, uh, people in Mississippi didn't stop mentioning Black people just because they went down Peter and came back Paul and got religion and changed their minds. They stopped because African-Americans became the mayors of these towns and the sheriffs of these towns. And you go back to the Mississippi Delta today, uh, most of those sheriffs in those counties are African-Americans. And I told you earlier, the head of the, the, uh, black, uh, the, 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 the largest city in Mississippi has a mayor. Who, who's, who, who's, who has an African name. So, and, he, and he's the second generation. His father was mayor before him. So, 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 so that makes a difference. And in places like Washington, D.C., where you have a compassionate mayor who works with a police department all the time, you have fewer of these incidents in places like that because it won't be tolerated. And, uh, I really want to thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for our country. Thank you for what you're doing now at the African-American Civil War Museum. 
and thank you for your words of encouragement and sharing your reflections here on State of Play. Thank you. Happy to do it. Come see us at the African American Civil War Museum.